Good afternoon, everyone. Friday afternoon down here in downtown Honolulu at the Think Tech Hawaii Studios. Ted Ralston, your host on the show Where the Road Leads. Uh, the, the episode we're going to be talking about today is uh, Where does the road lead? It leads to the future. And one of those aspects of the future that's most interesting to me and I know to our one of our guests here today is, uh, is that of the unmanned air vehicles, the UAVs, the drones, the robots of the sky, whatever you want to call them. Uh, Margie and I just returned from, in fact, we're a little stressed and sleep deprived here because we were at a conference on this subject in the mainland and just got here an hour late through the uh, airlines uh, situation and a little bit uh, perhaps uh, not quite as organized as I'd like to be, you but we're going to run this thing on, a, on an unstructured basis today. <laughs> but we've uh, had two recent conferences on the very subject of UAVs, deep, deep, digging deep into the issues that are behind them and, and, and what the barriers might be and where the future lies. Totally fascinating. It's changed my mind, and we're going to be bringing that into the University of Hawaii activity and into some activities with the FAA here in the future. But I'd like to say that one thing that characterizes this program, to all you who've been uh, uh, the listeners and watchers of it, is the quality of the guests we have on. And we continue that tradition today with our guest, Jay Fidel, uh -huh. who actually owns the studio. So <laughs> it's, it's a nonprofit. A, it's called Think Tech Hawaii. Think Tech Hawaii, you're right. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. May I say something it, about the hosts, too? we got great hosts, you know. <laughs> he cost, that costs five bucks, but uh, <laughs> anyway, my interaction with Jay started out probably a year and a half ago, maybe two, in some UAV panels we go around together or that you hosted, perhaps, and I got very interested in, um, in promoting the ideas, st stimulating the discussion as such, and that one thing led to the other, and now host this show. We haven't talked about UAVs in the last six or eight shows, so it's time to do that again, especially with the information that we've got. I brought some information here to show the audience at the right time, and I've got a piece of hardware over here. Well, I remember that. It was a lunch. It was a, a Think Tech lunch. Upstairs here. In Upstairs the, right, here yeah. in the Plaza Club, maybe a year and a half ago or so in the spring or the summer of 2013. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we thought it was a hard rock kind of program. You know, it's, 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 you know, it's interesting, but would anybody come? It's, it's tech, but would anybody care? And nobody had talked about it up till that point. The only references you saw were in national publications, nothing local. And we really wondered whether anybody would show up. And we, we set up that uh, panel. You were there. Um, gee, that, it was three or four other people, I remember. Right. Do you remember who they were? Yeah, we had, uh, I think, uh, General Wong was on. Right, yes. And um, Dean Crouch at UH. Yes. Uh, I think uh, Representative Ward was on. Yes, and, he likes uh, this. I think we had somebody from the UH Law School on. I can't place. We had, uh, uh, I think we had the, the dean of the UH Law School, Lovie Soifer. I, I, I apologize yeah, for not remembering that. Because there were legal yeah. constitutional questions yeah, about and, privacy right. and the like, and he raised them. Yeah. It was a fabulous, pa what, what, what surprised me, Ted, was that it was, it was wall to wall. I mean, out of, out of a program we thought was a little bit off, you know, now the place is filled up. And what we realized, this is, you got to learn by this what we realize is that people really care about drones. Are certainly interested in it and want to know what this uh, portends for their future. And that's what struck me about these last two conferences that we had the great pleasure of attending. I just want to hold up the, uh, the, the uh, brochure for the one that just entered yesterday, if I can, for the camera here. Mm -hmm. The title of this uh, program was Change is in the Air. It sounds like where the road leads. That's it sounds perfect. like something about the future. It's a double entendre. It's probably triple. It's, this was headed by the, the, the American Society of uh, Photogrammetric Research S Systems and such. So this is the people who take the results of UAVs and turn them into something useful and practical for uh, command decisions, for uh, administrative decisions and legal and this sort of thing. So it was really interesting to see the quality of the people that were at this particular conference. And in, in super particular, the insurance companies were present, oh, along with the legal uh, organizations. The insurance companies were there. You know, you n never quite know what you're going to get when you talk to the insurance company. But there was two components. One is making sure that these things are insurable, which is obviously important. But secondly, the value of the UAVs in reducing the risk to people in terms of uh, complex or dangerous inspections. Uh, damage assessment after uh, a disaster of some kind, and not putting people in, in that position. Use them as a tool. Use them. Right. I, I would guess, though, the primary thing is that they send people down who would consult with their underwriters to determine how much the premium would be 
you know, for UAV insurance. They're probably developing an insurance product. You know, they know that people are out there, they want to use UAVs, but they, you know, the boss will say, do you have insurance? And, you know, the, the manager will say, I think I, I've, well, I'll check with my insurance company. And well, these guys... What struck me, Jay, company. is how, how logical and fair that the whole thing's being played out and how, in, how affordable insurance really is because the risk is low. They assess the risk as low in, in certain categories, and therefore, therefore there's no, no serious consequence on a liability basis. However, there is a benefit to the reduction in cost of the operation of that enterprise, whatever it may be, if you don't put people don't expose them to a risky situation. Uh, for example, the system we can show here in a minute is being used by San Diego Gas and Electric to inspect the power grid out in their domains in the desert, the structure, the insulators, and the conductors in order to make sure that you only send a man aloft either on the uh, climbing the, the, the tower or in a helicopter well, if you, you absolutely to. know you have to, right? If you don't have to put that guy at risk, and the risk comes in two forms, not just the climbing, but also getting to where the, the power lines are, through ravines and such. So reducing the risk there is going to reduce their operating costs. Sure. And we came across an operation up in uh, Oregon who wants to take the same approach to inspecting solar farms. I guess they've got a lot of those in Oregon, and they're, they're, you know, they're fragile. And uh, they're kind of bright. You have to wear thick sunglasses to walk among the, the panels and such. And if you can just fly a small expendable robotic people, people UAV. People don't realize that you can fly that sucker right over the PV and then better yet you can have a camera that'll zoom in on every little defect in the PV so yeah. the, the you know this is much better than a human well, person. Well and it's and it's uh, that that was another major interest here the photogrammetric people or the people who do uh, uh, photographic analysis that is turning into a, a whole new direction uh, availed by the fact that these sensors can get down low and close and you avoid a lot of the big corrections and a lot of the losses and you get high, very high resolution in the pixel combined with the miniaturization and the reliability increase in the cameras themselves and combined with the affordability and the soon availability of LiDAR and infrared LIDAR? in lower claw systems. LiDAR, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, and that's another $5 to get that question asked. <laughs> I happen to have brought with me, once again, a, a shop drawing of, uh, of an 8-pound LiDAR system. I don't know how well this will show up. It's all kind of bland colors. But, okay, there's the host camera, and there's the picture of an 8-pound LiDAR. It's 8-pound total installations, about 3 pounds or 4 pounds to the LiDAR itself, and then there's data recording and there's batteries and such. But this is getting down into the range of unmanned air vehicles. And what is it, too? It's a, well, LiDAR, <laughs> thank you. LiDAR is like a radar, only instead of painting a picture of an airplane or something like that in, in a way from a targeting perspective, it is used to get it began to the three-dimensional space around you all throughout the whole 360-degree dome of the sky and, and around the horizon for looking at buildings, looking at uh, topography, looking at trees, and you can penetrate the, the canopy and get right down to the ground. You can uh, analytically remove the buildings and look at what the terrain looks like underneath. Really a superb way to get very precise so it sends back a sort of 3D map of what it sees. It generates it. ultimately a 3D map, right. Yeah. And then that's really useful in something like uh, disaster damage analysis because lines on buildings are generally straight where the beams aren't broken. If there's some uh, kapakahiness in there, then we've got some potential damage. So, and of Kapa course... Kapakahi. Kapakahiness. I just c created I, I, that I think you there. owe me five bucks on that okay. one. Okay. <laughs> So, but this was just one example of a, of a lightweight lighter, and we saw two more that were even lighter, uh, down to 600 grams. That's like a little over a pound, pound and a half, for something that today uh, people will pay a million bucks for 55 pounder, or in the past 300 pounds. So this miniaturization and reliability is opening the door to people using these systems in ways they've never used them before, which is then taking the analysts and challenging them to improve and speed up the analysis of the information. That then looks at the information architecture, how you take information and flow it to those who need it. And ultimately, the two guys in a truck who are the first on the scene are going to be given much more, inf much more uh, results than they've seen before. They won't necessarily have more information because it's unreasonable to have them do analysis. But it's certainly possible to paint a picture of that building, that ravine, that power line, that riverbank, that 
that uh, land uh, that uh, landform that's about ready to uh, slide right there in the truck and let them make decisions that are much more uh, quick, much more timely, and uh, much more risk averse, and and much more effective in terms of understanding what they have to do in, in example of a damage situation. However, it's not a moment more on lidar. Yeah, because I think lidar is wrong. I remember a guy who's here in this building across the street. Um, who was working on a LIDAR device that would, that would measure wind. And the, re the reason for this device, the purpose of it, was to establish wind patterns so you could situate a wind turbine in a wind farm. Okay? And, you know, and they'd take you know, six months, a year to do this ordinarily. they take all kinds of readings. They take a year. It's a kind of a know. year mandate to get it, the right. Right. To get it right, you know, and they take all kinds of tests. But with the LIDAR, he could cut that into a small fraction. Because it's not that the LIDAR sent back a picture of the topography or the buildings, but the wind. So in other words, what I'm thinking is LIDAR can measure anything you want. As long and as you... So Tune the, the LIDAR frequencies to the size of the molecule you're looking for. You can exactly. measure signal attenuation to determine the presence of some species, such as, uh, and that's an interesting point. The agriculture people are looking at that same approach. I can't say it's a done deal at this point, but the idea of taking a big, heavy uh, laser scanner, which is a form of LIDAR, and a big eight-wheel truck with a lot of power, um, don't try to carry it on the UAV, but on the UAV, carry a cheap plastic reflector. Fly the UAV out of its maximum radius in the area that you have of interest and run the laser beam at it and back and measure the attenuation. If you've tuned the laser wavelengths to the molecule you're looking for, say bunchy top banana virus in this case, uh, you can potentially pick up the pre-emergent markers of uh, biological markers and such, biological uh, environmental tests uh, through LIDAR. Of all We've things. only begun. If, really? That's right. I think the, the concept and the, the notion of changes in the air camera is exactly on target. And in fact, the themes coming out of this particular conference, which I say again were user oriented, not UAV supplier oriented, were that uh, they used the term the Kodak moment as the example. Kodak, remember, invented the CCD, the charge couple device for digital cameras 40 years ago or so, and then thought, ah, well, it probably won't ever catch on. We've got piles and piles of yellow film to sell. And so, where's Kodak today? Right. So <laughs> this was like a, almost like a warning shot across the bow saying, folks, the world's changing and there are capabilities that are emerging that have never been seen before. And the customers, the users, are going to start demanding this functionality. But then, the question you didn't ask yet, uh, another five dollars, which way it goes, I'm not sure. But these things are getting so small that it, it's university level analysis and, and design that can go on. We don't, we don't need big factories. And furthermore, we can do this work in Hawaii. Because in Hawaii, we don't have large factories. We don't have natural resources that are useful for making airplanes, for example. Well, you but know, I've been interviewing <coughs> members of SOAS, the School of Ocean yeah. Earth Science and Technology, and various other researchers in the university, and uh, a lot of them into the environment. Of course, you know, natural phenomenon, one kind or another. And the most important thing in their, in their kit uh, is, are their measuring tools. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the tools that get them there and then give them data, and then they can go. And so it's <coughs> uh, measuring uh, and then bringing it back to a mainframe or a large computer to process it, and then interpreting the results that you get on the, on the process. And it's, it's really very simple kind of concept, flowchart, if you will. Um, but it seems to me that the, uh, the platform of, of the drone now uh, is a huge new tool where scientists of every kind of nature are going to be able to measure things they could never measure before. And so I, uh, you're absolutely right. And you're absolutely right that a lot of this has to do with research that is already underway at the university right here. Mm -hmm. And once again, uh, from a business perspective, because we don't need large-scale manufacturing facilities, and, and this, stuff, this stuff can be shipped belly cargo on an airplane as a, from a marketing perspective. There's no reason Hawaii couldn't play a major role in the design and even the fabrication of systems like this. Let me, uh, one more example. This just came in today's Aviation Week, and I, I don't know if the camera can even zoom in this small. I'll show it to Jay, and he'll have to testify 
uh, for all of those out there. What's I'll going testify on. for you, Ted. This is a hand. Okay, you see the hand there. So it is. And it's holding a thing about the and size the of a... the is about that size. Yeah. It's like yeah. six it's inches. About, about that much of a hand holding yeah. something that's about half that size. About the size of a rhinoceros beetle, I would say. <laughs> and this thing is a... What? Okay, we got it. It's a, it's a one-mile range, uh, fully autonomous UAV with a, uh, a day video sensor on it, and reading it here, and a night infrared sensor on it that operates at a mile radius uh, and this is uh, it's called the uh, the PD-100 Black Hornet out of uh, Norway, uh, Norway. Norway makes it. Made in uh, Norway? Made in Norway. And um, <laughs> so here's here's how small these things are getting. Now this is for the military so I'm sure it's not a throwaway item. It's not cheap but uh, the point is so that once again we, we can do that too. Just, it, just think about that though. I mean it's that big nobody would notice it and yet it would notice everything. It's 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 incredible. Well, that it, it, you know what we're doing uh, with the one we've got here. This, by the way, I'll show you this after we take our break and put it together. We we've got one for the University of Hawaii now, and there's uh, we're getting uh, the, the guys over there at Hilo under Don Strainy's operation at UH Hilo have uh, gotten what's called a COA certificate of, certificate of authorization to fly over the Pahoa lava field from the FAA. Yeah, and so they're making progress and beginning to understand how to get quick turnaround in situ data that anticipates the situation with the lava flow. Uh, but we can also look at infrared uh, signatures at night, which is something that typically at night uh, during like uh, search and rescue or something like that, we shut down at night. Well, because what would you look at with the infrared? Well, infrared, you can, you can pick up, you can tune it, of course, and you can pick up the body temperature of a person or an animal relative to the background uh, terrain and define the location of a person or an animal. Sounds so like zero dark 30 to me. <laughs> well, it starts at probably 1800 or so. But in <laughs> fact, we'll, we'll be uh, we're talking with uh, some folks about using that very system to check out the uh, the goats that are escaping and running rampant in the Makapu'u area of, uh, of the, you know, in the Waimanalo uh, Ko'olaus. And so we can help the guys under, understand what they have out there from a devastation perspective by finding these guys at night. We also had some interesting experience um, with uh, Cindy Hunter. You mentioned uh, Celeste. Uh, she's with the Marine Sciences Option Program at UH. And looking at the bleached coral off Lani Kai. And lo and behold, the what's called the near-infrared uh, cameras on the small UAVs showed a brilliant uh, lavender reflection uh, where, the, where the bleaching is. So if we... They were surprised by that, did not expect that result. Now that says we need a program to figure out what the frequency markers are that indicate where the coral damage is. Then we can find a way that anybody can determine coral damage by putting that kind of a camera out uh, well, over so the if region. You know, if you know you can make decisions on the basis of color, <laughs> yeah. just take the color and you can have a huge map. Let's, uh, let, let, it'll take me 30 seconds to put this together to show people some examples, but to the point you're making about the analysis and the Availability of information. This is just one of the various uh, workshop presentation materials uh, from the, the conference that we were just attending. And this is the ability to determine stockpile values in a mine or any form of any area where landforms are changing for the purpose of identifying your commercial value if you're a, a mine person or looking at you know, land erosion or land accumulation in the case of a, of a, of a flood or something like that. Again, done just by the two guys in a truck. So this is something we've never, never had before. There's a social change that's coming associated with this. We can talk about that after the break. But Jay, it's great to have you on your own show tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back in 30. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I'm the host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about why people should like science, why science is actually fun, how science is a dynamic and vital part of everyone's life, why everyone, every man, woman, and child on the planet should really know science, should love science, should be familiar with science. So it's a great show. People come on here and have interesting conversations with us. They tell us why they do what they do, why they love it, why we should love it too. I hope you'll join us every Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. And of course, you can see it anytime on YouTube. Aloha. Ted Ralston again here, folks, Friday afternoon at the Think Tech Studios, downtown Honolulu, where the road leads. The road leads to the future. The future is going to be illuminated, 
uh, analyzed and uh, pictorialized by UAVs to the betterment of us all. So we were just talking before the break about the types of technology, the miniaturization, the value they generate by virtue of their uh, wide avail availability through the miniaturization to uh, folks in the emergency response and environmental management and ultimately 24-7 civil infrastructure roles. We just during the break brought out an example here. This uh, is a copy. This is called an instant eye out of the special ops uh, forces in the U.S. military. But UH has a copy of this. Just I think we've seen it here before, but I wanted to bring another sensor into the game. This very small system has three cameras on it. Uh, this, these two cameras are used to fly the vehicle. This is the science camera to pick up the near-infrared reflection. This camera... It's all a quarter-inch wide. Yeah, right. Maybe, you, know, then you could maybe get a pencil light in there. <laughs> and uh, this little lens here is the one that picked up that coral reflectance, the bleached coral reflectance over at Lundy Kai. And then if we add this to it, this is called a FLIR, or forward-looking infrared, uh, infrared uh, uh, camera. This has a mount that goes on in, in a way that parallels the, the so native cameras. Forward. Yeah. And it looks forward, so you can see um, body signatures, heat signatures at night, uh, which will be used for um, search and rescue, ungulate uh, patrol in the areas where we have ungulates running around, ruining the environment, and uh, soon the solar panel inspection I mentioned in Oregon. What's and more than likely we'll use ungulate? it as the thing that's got four legs, like a pig, yeah. and it, it uh, carries around seeds from one invasive species, and it transports them across the terrain and plants them elsewhere. Okay, it's, so not, a, it's not a family member or anything. Uh, it's not like, you know, my mother's brother, anything like that. I, I, uh, I suspect that's not. It's not an ungulate. No, okay, no, right. no. I, okay. I, okay. That was a pun, folks, in case you weren't paying attention. Sorry, it's, a, <laughs> it's what they call a failed pun. <laughs> a pun, yeah. Okay. So, uh, once again, here's some examples, and uh, my mind is just full of the experience of meeting and dealing with folks who are pushing forward hard in this direction and they're able to see a business future here and an educational component future that we have to characterize and then bottle and, and make happen. So what's happening at the university here uh, is uh, university uh, both in well, all campuses but primarily Hilo and, uh, and Manoa will be taking on the operations and the engineering aspects of UAV design and development and research grants as well as operational missions. Uh, and it's good to have the certificate. That's the, the key. The, the right. We've been waiting for well, that. Let, we'll, let's talk about that FAA thing in a minute. That's okay. another whole subject. And uh, FAA, I love them to death. Uh, we're making progress. The, the COA is a bridge function. We'll just hold that for the moment. But the point I wanted to make is that as these systems get smaller, uh, reliability increases in general because we're taking out connections and taking out solder joints and such and making the electronics uh, one piece, for example, the structures are one piece. Mm -hmm. But we also have issues of electromagnetic interference between pieces because they are getting so small. Antennas interfere with each other. Perfect type of area for UH in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering and such to develop expertise and, and uh, standard setting uh, to help push this whole technology forward. There's areas in the film, area, film production area and in the, uh, even in the cartooning areas where computer vision, which is a form of what's used to draw cartoons these days, is a great way to think about assessing a, a, a picture. And so we have to really get to the people who are thinking about graphic interfaces and such and bring them into the picture as well. And then, of course, we have the, 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 the people who take care of environmental monitoring and such, which... Uh, will forever blow you away in how they think and how they see and how they can uh, 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 partition the way the nature works and how these sensors can help them better understand that. It also, I've noticed, we, by making this capability available in ways we've never seen before, we generate little competitions between, we'll say, the leaf-shaped people who want to look at leaves and understand their shape versus the reflectance people who want to look at the chemical characterization of the leaf. Together, this is probably the right answer, but we have schools of thought and training that, that lead people into, into structured thinking, and these kind of systems allow that to bridge together and to enhance the, enhance the picture. What about the working drones? In other words, uh, they're not looking at anything, but it's not their primary function. Um, they're, they're skyscraper, 
mm, nobody wants to go up and clean the windows. Uh, why couldn't you have a drone to do that? It is, you could probably think hard about how you want to do that. There's probably a combination of a robot that hangs on the side of the building and a drone Instead of to flying, it's, it's not efficient right. to fly. However, but a, uh, hanging on the side of the building could be very efficient. In, in other areas, it certainly is where it would probably start. Uh, uh, L.A. County Fire wants to use, once again, this same system because it's available and robust and fairly inexpensive to fly around the, the window belt of a building that's on fire. And, and get a picture of what's, who's inside. Is there anybody inside? Is there any motion going on? Is there any people? And then go to the next floor and fly around the perimeter, go to the next floor, and, and characterize what's to, to plan their, their, their rescue, uh, as an example. Um, but what I was pointing out was that uh, the technology availability not only helps the operators and provides an educational theme that we can build on here, but is generating entirely new ways to look at imagery and look at analysis. So we have the LIDAR people, which are getting smaller and more efficient, as I described. And we have the people who are putting incredibly creative uh, analysis methods together for photographs, called uh, structure from motion is one term. Uh, the point cloud is another term. The ray cloud is a term beyond the point cloud. Ways to use plain old photographs from a $200 Canon camera to get information that basically is, is just as useful as the, as the LIDAR. So uh, the availability, once again, the availability of this kind of information rapidly is spinning up the folks who do analysis. And it's just, I can't even imagine what this road to the future discussion will have in two years sitting here. Well, suppose some young fellow came in right now, sat down over there, and said, you know, you guys seem to know a lot about, it. well, one of you anyway, <laughs> seems to know a lot about drones. That would be him, folks. <clears throat> and, and I believe in technology, and I think maybe I can get into one of those accelerators, uh, startup accelerators. Uh, but point me, Ted, it, to exactly one project that I should work on. Give me the core idea for my entrepreneurial adventure. What do I do? I think the, the step, the most important step would be in the, in the case of something that we can all embrace as, uh, as already licensed socially to do, and that would be in, in disaster management. And disaster management doesn't have to be a flood or a hurricane or a lava flow. It can also be a search and rescue. It can be a lost person off a boat at night. It can be a, uh, uh, it can be a, uh, well, the coral bleaching in Lani Kai, for example. And so there's numerous programs that can, um, that can move forward uh, that would, take that initiative that that young person has and, and find a way to make something out of it. Well, Chuck Devaney, who was supposed <laughs> to be here today, <laughs> yeah. works on that for, what, the Department of Geography at UH? Chuck and works he went to the Philippines, and he has a, you know, a whole collection of drones. Isn't there already technology to do exactly what you're saying? There is, and it's increasing in its use, and it's increasing in its availability and affordability and reliability. It is going to take the affordability increase to drive the business is going to take the reliability increase to drive the acceptance in a social way. And you did mention Chuck, and yes, we really wanted to have him on here today because he's uh, been a, a trooper on your show here and a trooper taking this story to the world. He will be, in fact, when we talk about where the road leads, this has led Chuck in a whole new direction. He will be departing Hawaii on Tuesday and going to Dallas for a new job as an executive in a, in a, what's called an NGO or a non-government no operation. Oh, well, congratulations oh. to him. Congratulations to Chuck. Hats Paul. off to you, Chuck Devaney. Come and say yeah. hi one of these days. Uh, we knew you when, Chuck. We knew you when. <laughs> and uh, uh, he'll be working with the NGO called Link the World, which is uh, attempting to use technology such as this to provide information that is useful to share around the world. That's to great. Increase the human condition. That's and. That all came from probably from being on your show here, Jay, where it, where it kind of started. So I, you know, I, you know, it's a, your story about uh, how you know your life has changed over this. You've become so interested in it only in the past year or two. Uh, Chuck Devaney, and I think there are probably others, and I and that's encouraging because you and I both agree that it's important that Hawaii get in on this. But because it's new and disruptive technology, you have to change your life in order to adopt it. You have to change your life, and then, like everything else where there's a change that's gone on, there has to be a social license created that allows it to move forward in a wide band of acceptability. So we had some really interesting discussions up in Alaska with the representative, the state representative up there who's 
moving from a negative to a positive orientation by the social license, which contains the parameters of law enforcement. It contains the methods of managing uh, this uh, hobgoblin out there called uh, invasion of privacy. And then, of course, the utility and value to the economics of the, of the state or the nation and the safety and the public, public, public safety aspects. Those are the parameters of the zones in which the social license will occur. And if you think back a little bit to things like uh, license plate readers, what, 10, 15 years ago, everybody was concerned about license plate readers as a violation of invasion of privacy or something along those lines. You don't hear much about that anymore. They're there. That was yeah. a silly argument. Well, if you use the public roads, your license plate is an identifier, identifier and everyone should be able to see it right. and record it. Nevertheless, there was an outpouring of emotion over that for mm -hmm. yeah. 10 years or so. And, uh, so change happens. Uh, change happens for the good. Uh, things that work well and succeed continue. Things that are not main parts of the trunk of the tree, uh, good branches, disappear. But you uh, called, you called um, the privacy issue the hobgoblin. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the hobgoblin. Halloween's of coming around. <laughs> and, uh, but you know what? It occurs to me, this, this is interesting, is that <clears throat> this technology, this is really just like the license plate reader. Um, puts a test on, on conventional notions of privacy. You know, we know we're losing our privacy in so many ways. I mean, it, it wasn't only 9-11 that made us start losing our privacy. We've been losing it for a long time. And two, technology. So we're living in the 21st century. And, and so uh, it seems to me that this technology is actually not only going to make privacy something other than a hobgoblin, um, but it's going to change our definition of privacy. Well, the expectations of the public change over time as technology becomes available. I think if you take you yourself back to the, the day after Gutenberg published his first uh, publications, I'm sure there were people running around saying, gee, you've invaded my privacy because you can print something about me, make 100 copies, and it used to be I had to chip it out of stone, which took a long time. Now you made it very quick. <laughs> and then uh, cameras. You, you heard it here on yeah. Think Tech. <laughs> it's cameras. Gutenberg. I know it. It was him all along, right? I, you knew it, right? So... so uh, Right now, the, I think the, my personal view is the biggest risk to, uh, to invasion of privacy is all the GoPros running around on the beach. Everybody's got a GoPro on a stick and taking pictures. Those are facial recognition pictures on, on the beach. These things looking from overhead, it's very difficult to identify anybody as a personal individual because all you see is either hair or none. And you don't get any of the markers that are useful in identifying. We've somebody. had telephone, telephoto lenses, and and paparazzi for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Forget about privacy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but again, I think the real invasion is the, the, the people at the beach with all cameras. People are now wearing wearable jewelry that records every five seconds of your life, which you can then put on YouTube that night. And I was just on the airplane. We were reading a, one of these sales magazines, and this guy got a pen. And it's got a recorder in it and a camera. So I can sit here and pretend I'm writing something, and it's actually taking a picture of, of you. So <laughs> invasion of privacy, uh, all technology, all new things have a positive and negative. Cars, well, weapons, alcohol, dynamite. Yeah, but you got to respect you know, the, the view that it, this is um, an inva uh, it's invasive or more invasive than, thing, than it used to be. And, and, uh, you know, there's a legitimate concern about it, and we're going to have to settle so, out on that. That's right. That, so you, you know. certainly, what you and, do is And the police really do, you know, tend to abuse these things sometimes. Uh, they see this technology as a, a free-for-all. Uh, so somebody has to put limits on that. Exactly. The limits and the parameters are what, this, and the means by which you discipline and control the operation and penalize those who are deviating is, what, is how it has to work, just like paparazziism. And, uh, and alcohol, uh, drugs, cars, airplanes for that matter, dynamite. So we, we don't blow each other up with dynamite because we have a sort of a behavioral standard that prevents that. Same will be true here. So we, that's, but that's all part of the social license and we need that. We need that, that strong focus and, and the technology people cannot just assume that it's gonna happen. It's gonna take effort and work and but basically education with the, with the public. And, and where the values outweigh the consequences is how this has to be staged. Well, once I think people learn that the values are so great, um, you know, once, this, once these certificates enable research and use of these, these vehicles, people are going to see the possibility. Right now it's kind of contained because not everybody can go out 
and experiment with it and, and use yeah. it and explore it. Let's talk about that just a little bit since uh, that's a, a good thing I wanted to end on here. We all try to poke the FAA in the eye because this is moving very fast and such. And it's, it's uh, FAA, I've learned to, over the years working with them in aviation and now in this domain, uh, they need, just need help. And they're looking forward to all the help they can get. We had a meeting yesterday with the uh, head of the Nevada uh, uh, state uh, site function, and he's in the same situation we are here, looking for help to move the FAA forward. And demanding something out of them will never get anywhere. It doesn't do it. They admit they're in a bridge situation. All these COAs you hear about and exemptions are, are bridges that they're basically generating loopholes to allow this type of work to move forward in spite of themselves. And so I salute them for having thought this through. They're looking for a way that they can move from uh, what's called functional hazard analysis to specific risk analysis. And then specific risk looks at the catastrophic effect of something like this and says there isn't any, there isn't much more than a seagull weight, weight of mass here. So no, cat no catastrophic function. It's going to have a w much wider range of potential use and lower certification requirements relative to something that weighs, say, 100,000 pounds. So the FAA is changing how it's going to do certification. But just having said that, now it has to re-educate 15,000 people inside the agency. It has to create training and certification standards that it hasn't done before. So what we have just in the middle of generating a conspiracy to go help them. And I think they'll take all the help they can get. Uh, they've said that. And if they don't like the help, they won't take it. But if it's useful, uh, it'll help us all move forward. So They're going to need help, you know, because the, an unregulated system with these can you imagine what creative kids can do? Uh, can you imagine drones fighting over your head? Can you m imagine all the risks involved with unresponsible, irresponsible people uh, use these things? They really have to be regulated. Uh, on the other hand, it doesn't take forever. Right, and I think we can all band together and help, as opposed to accuse the FAA of being slow and stodgy and such. We can help move forward, and there are ways to do that through uh, uh, risk analysis methods, risk mitigation methods, uh, there's a lot of modeling and simulation involved in that, and, uh, and once again, a great place for the universities to step in with, this, with the powerful computers we've got and the mathematical methods that look at, at, at propagation of error and, and such terms such as that that are useful in, in helping see how we can put the regulations in place and accelerate the whole process. So what's the first step? The first step is we've got a uh, uh, a white paper to generate out of our meeting just this week on, on saying, Dear FAA, here's a couple of different ways we can help you move forward. And if, if you'd like, let's talk about these. Let's find a way that NASA and the FAA can agree that some of the an analytic work we can do will be useful and, and then push it forward and then learn from that. Take the next step after the first step. We have to take baby steps there. Can you or an organization in, in which you're involved move that ahead? Is there an organization? Can we create one? Well, uh, there is actually. Yeah, there is. There, there, AVUSA is the uh, AVUSI, I guess it is. I can't remember. It's the national group of the uh, fiction autos for here. They're, they have a powerful lobby, and they can affect that. But more, it takes the folks who've been managing massive risk issues in the past, who know how to do that, bring them forward. So we're working with a group called the Aerospace Corp in L.A., which is a federal uh, think tank that manages all space launch. And they make sure that a rocket doesn't come back on us. And, uh, and the other thing they manage is all the uh, 20,000 bits and pieces flying around in orbit that are called space <laughs> junk. So they understand how to take massive, catastrophic, uh, a complex systems and characterize them and then mitigate against them and manage them. So we're thinking that those techniques that they've got, combined with the supercomputers we've got here in Hawaii and in Alaska, would be a super capability base to generate a virtual uh, environment where the FAA can learn together with us as we prod and poke at that environment with all kinds of simulated failures in UAVs and determine what's going to work and what's not. Yeah, we and, what is it, Alaska have a special um, region for, um, for research and, and discovery uh, around drones. So we, we're, we already have a kind of special position, so to speak, by virtue of that. And now it's a question of, of actually moving forward 
Correct. Getting research organizations to look at this, um, getting the government to incentivize and fund it. And those, you just said two important things, research organizations and government incentive. Neither of those are present in this FAA test site issue that you mentioned a few minutes ago. Yes, Hawaii, Alaska, and Oregon are the Pan-Pacific partners. Iceland has been brought into the picture as another extreme environment. I Iceland? Yes, it's the 51st state, in case you hadn't read the paper. I know today. they speak English. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, it, well, that's, and then there's the Mid-Atlantic, there's Texas, there's uh, North Dakota, there's uh, Nevada, and uh, I think that's what the sixth, if I hit six there. Anyway, uh, banding together, in fact, you just asked her what the code for this conspiracy is. The issue is that the, the six sites have to get together. and advise the FAA of what they must do to move forward and not wait for the FAA to tell them. The FAA is not going to get there. Good strategy. So just reverse this thing and make friends, and, and that's what we're, what we're thinking of. Yeah. Now, I must say, I'm not speaking for this. I'm speaking only for my own personal views here. After having a lot of interesting meetings, we haven't really coordinated this with, this, with the state agencies yet, except for the Nevada, Nevada group. You know, I mean, I've, I've been observing uh, you um, in your, you know, maturation on this issue, and I, and I must say, you're a natural leader to, to speak on behalf of those who would see drones, uh, and, you know, deployed and, and, and improved, uh, speak to government and try to get government to do things about it. I mean, and you could speak to Gene Ward and people like him, but it takes um, somebody at the point. And uh, let me say, I really, I really feel, Ted, that you should be the one and I hope you do something about it. Well, we certainly are. I've been doing it, and we're going to continue. And every every time we have a gathering of these of these people, you see how how motivated, how um, intelligent they are, and uh, and they don't understand the word no. And it's 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 sort of like the Elon Musk approach to rocket launch. <laughs> you know what's going on there, and uh, and Tesla. The, the, what did Tesla do? He released all of our or uh, yeah. Elon Musk. He released all of his IP. He release all his patents. Typically, the approach is hang on to that as hard as you can, try and get money out of it. He said, I'll make more money if everybody else increases the size of the market and I'm four years ahead. And there's these strategies that aren't taught at Harvard Business School that are changing the world. Google is out there doing it and, and such. And so, yeah, we really need to uh, think of this as a small element of that whole changing paradigm of how to do business. However it's done, uh, Hawaii should be a leader. Amen. Hawaii should have an industry. Hawaii should find and technology that nobody else There's no finding. reason we can't because the, all the markers are here. Yeah. And the, uh, the issues that uh, uh, there's nothing we don't need that's present here, including the motivation. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> don't stop. Okay, we won't, for yeah. sure, Jay. And, Good and for please you don't stop you. pushing on us. And by the way, that last comment is going to cost me 10 bucks, right? Not the usual five, I'm sure. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. I mean, I think it's great that you went to that conference. I think you should go to every conference. Easy for me to say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and I think, uh, you know, an organization should be organized uh, to, make, to watch and make sure that we take advantage of every opportunity and that we become, uh, you know, a leadership state in this, in this area. You know it's going to go forward, and we want to be there. I agree with you. Amen. Okay. Well, we've, I think, reached uh, beyond the end of our hour here, and I apologize for the slightly late start, but we had, I think, a really good conversation. And so, once again, folks, Ted Ralston here, your host on Where the Road Leads and Leads to the Future, our discussion today, and our guest, Jay Fidel. Jay, I thank you so much for coming on this program. Thank you, Ted. I just hang around in the studio yep. and say hi. I got it. Okay. And then we'll see you all next week at uh, 4 o'clock. Have a nice weekend, everybody.